Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom McNulty, and I'm here with our presenter, Aya Takase. Thank you all for attending Rogaku's webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. This is our fourth segment, Foams and Composite Applications. It will focus on the principles and techniques researchers use to develop optimized methods for a wide range of composite materials and foams. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Please note, if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can view them on the Rigaku website. When today's presentation ends, you'll automatically be directed to a Rigaku webpage containing links for the previous three webinars. Now, as far as today goes, as usual, we'll be taking questions during the live webcast. We ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, we will not be monitoring the raised hand or chat features. We will be saving your questions submitted during the webcast and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, that said, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Aya Takase. Welcome, Aya. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. Today, we will talk about foams and composites applications. So, X-ray imaging is a form of photography, and the history of a photography goes back to 1800s. The earliest surviving camera photography was taken in 1826 or maybe 27. It's never been clear. But anyway, this is an enhanced version of that photograph. A French scientist, Nicephore Nips, invented the first photographic process and recorded this view. And you might notice that those buildings are illuminated from both sides. This is because it took eight hours to record this image, and the sun was moving during that eight hour exposure. And if it takes eight hours, you really can't use this technique to take pictures of people. So we needed to wait until 1830s to 40s when Nips's associate, Louis Daguerre, went on to develop a new method. And he showed in the process down to minutes. And this picture was created a lot later, but shows what it was like to take a portrait. Because it took a minute, people would use a tool like this to hold their heads still so that their faces don't get blurred. But we're in 2019 and literally in a split second, you can take a picture so nobody needs to stay still anymore. But that is for regular photography. When it comes to X-ray CT imaging, it's common for people to spend hours, sometimes even 10, 20, 30 hours, just to image one sample. So it's important to make sure that the sample doesn't move during that long experiment. And this is one of the keys to high resolution imaging. So in this webinar today, you will learn some keys to high resolution imaging. We're gonna talk about high resolution imaging because it's important for foams and composites applications. And we will look at a number of application examples. So why high resolution? Why do we need a high resolution to look at foams and composites? When you think about foams, in many cases, people wanna look at the cells or pores. And the size of the cell generally varies from microns to millimeters. For the composites, usually those composites have some sort of fibers, glass fibers or carbon fibers, and the fiber diameter varies from five to 30 microns. If you wanna see a cell or a fiber that is five microns in size, you're gonna need a pretty high resolution to see them well. And generally speaking, to achieve high quality in X-ray CT imaging, you need to optimize the X-ray energy. And this is what we talked about in the last webinar. And you also want to optimize the resolution. And this is what we're going to talk about today. I say optimize the resolution, not to use the highest resolution possible. And this is because the resolution is in a trade-off relationship 
with other things like x-ray intensity or scan time. So you just don't want to simply go for the highest resolution. You want to optimize it. And that brings us, bring us to the next question. So what resolution is high enough then? So let's think about this for a minute. For example, let's say this is a structure we're trying to image, some sort of fiber or cell walls. And we're gonna think about the voxel size first. The voxel size is the size of box you're gonna use to sample this structure or image. And if you use too large of a voxel size, your image might look like this. You can't even see what kind of structure you have there. But if you use a small enough of a voxel size, you can get an image as the structure looks like. And in this example, let's say we're gonna look at a relatively small or narrow part of this uh, structure and it's two microns in size. And if you wanna see this two micron feature, your voxel size needs to be at least half of it. Ideally, you want that to be one fifth to one tenth of the size of the feature you're trying to resolve. But at least just to see that it's there, that voxel size needs to be at least half of the feature size. So let's take a look at an actual CT cross sections and see what happens if the voxel size is too large. So this is a cross section of a foam material. And this was collected at 2.12 micron voxel size. And there should be a polymer wall separating two cells there, but you can't even see that it's there in this image. If you use about one micron voxel size to look at the same thing, now you can kind of see that there is a little line there. If you go down to about quarter a micron, then you can clearly see that there is a polymer wall between two cells. Let me zoom in. So there is the wall and you can see a profile here and there is clearly a gray level peak and you can even measure the thickness of this wall. And for this sample, the thickness of this wall turned out to be 1.9 microns. And if you use two micron voxel size to see this, you're gonna miss it and you can't even see that it's there. So to summarize, if the size of the feature you're trying to resolve is, for example, five microns, the voxel size needs to be at least half of it. In other words, you need at least two voxels to sample that area and see that that feature is there. Ideally, you want that to be a little bit smaller, something like half a micron to 2.5 microns. And this is just the voxel size that we're going to use for sampling. But if the resolution function that's coming from all the hardware pieces on the X-ray CT scanner is a lot larger than the voxel size, then this resolution function is going to blur the image and no matter how small of a voxel size you choose, you cannot resolve this feature. Everything gets blurred. So it's also important to make sure that the resolution function size is comparable to the voxel size you're selecting. Now, what determines the resolution function? The resolution function depends on the X-ray focus size and the pixel size on the detector and the overall geometry. For example, if this is the focal size you're using, and if it's drifting, that drift needs to be taken into account as well. And now let's say the overall defocusing coming from the geometry is about this size. And you have the pixel size on the detector. Technically, you can calculate the resolution function just by convoluting all of them together. But Practically, it's actually easier to measure the resolution. You can measure what's called spatial resolution. And the spatial resolution is related to both the resolution function and the voxel size. And this spatial resolution more or less tells you the smallest feature size you can resolve with the setting you're using. So this is something you can measure or test. But how do you test this resolution? So there are tools you can use to do this. This one is called 
micro CD bar pattern phantom by QRM. And it's just a little piece, probably about an inch in size. And this piece has line pairs varying from five to 150 microns laid out like this. And you can do a CT scan of this little piece and see how small of a line pairs you can resolve. And the smallest line pair you can resolve is essentially your spatial resolution. That's the smallest feature you can resolve. If you need to test a resolution below five microns, QRM makes this nano bar pattern as well. And this one has one to 10 microns line pairs laid out like this. And this is an example of a CT scan um, tested on the nano bar pattern. And this image was collected at 2.2 micron voxel size. At this voxel size setting, you can easily resolve the eight micron line pairs. You can see six microns, no problem. And you can see four micron line pairs as well, but you can kind of see that you're approaching the limit of what you can see with this resolution. And this makes sense because four microns is about double of the voxel size 2.2 microns. So this is the smallest feature you can resolve with this setting. And the fact that you can see four micron line pairs with 2.2 micron voxel size means that the resolution function size is comparable to the voxel size. So this is for micron level resolution. If you need to test something less than one micron, you can use this resolution chart by JIMA. This is only for 2D measurement, but it has line pairs from 0 0.1 to 15 microns. And this is a 2D measurement example on 0 0.6 micron line pairs. If you zoom into this area, you can see that the 0 0.6 micron lines are result. And this image was collected with 0 0.27 micron voxel size setting. So again, you're seeing something about double in size of the voxel size. And this means that your resolution function size is comparable to the voxel size. So this is how you can test the resolution, actual resolution you have on the system you're using. And it's important to achieve high resolution and make sure that you have the resolution you need to get high quality images or to make your images look better or pretty. But it is also important for the quantitative analysis. So how does this, the resolution, affect analysis results? So let's take a look at an example of a foam analysis. So this is a piece of a heat insulator, just like the insulator people use in the walls of the houses or buildings. And the porosity is an important parameter for heat insulators because you need to increase the porosity to have a lot of air in it to make it work as efficient heat insulator. So let's say that we want to measure the porosity of this foam. You can take a small piece out of it and do a CT scan. And if the resolution is high enough, you will see very, very thin polymer walls clearly. Then you can do the image segmentation for pores or cells and the polymer part and calculate the porosity. And it came out as 96.7% for the sample. So this is all good, but what happens if you change the voxel size and you use larger voxel size or lower resolution? This is what happens. Those are the different voxel sizes we use to scan the same sample. And those are the calculated porosity values for different images. When you use 0 0.53 or 0 0.63 micron voxel size, and that is about a quarter of the feature size we're looking at here, you can get consistently the same number, 96.7% as the porosity. But if you continue to increase that voxel size, the calculated porosity starts to increase as well. So now your quantitative analysis result is changing. This happens because when the voxel size is small enough, you can see the polymer cell walls and segment those voxels. 
but if you use too large of a voxel size, then those walls start to disappear and you start counting those voxels as air or pore by mistake. And that is why the calculated porosity can change. So achieving a high resolution, as you can see here, is important to do quantitative analysis accurately. Now, how do you achieve a high resolution? Let's say that we all agree that the high resolution is important, but how do we achieve this? So there are two basic rules. One is to use a high magnification factor. So that's probably obvious enough. But using the highest magnification factor available on the cone beam geometry you're using is not good enough. You might need one micron or sub-micron resolution. Then you can switch to the parallel beam geometry. And those two things uh, we discussed in the first webinar. So today I would like to talk about some more additional keys to high resolution imaging. One of them is to correct the focus. And I will explain what this is in a second. The other thing is to eliminate the sample movement or deformation. If you can eliminate the sample movement or deformation, you can try to run a fast scan. So let's talk about those four points. First, correcting the focus. So let's say that we want, you're gonna take a picture of this girl, but the camera is out of focus, then the picture could look like this, and this is not good. You have to make sure that your camera is in focus. Equivalent of this for X-ray CT is to do the focus correction. But what is focus correction? Let's think about the cone beam geometry. So you have the X-ray focus and the sample, a sample stage and the detector. And to bring the reconstructed image into focus, you have to make sure that the X-ray focus and the center of sample rotation, not necessarily the center of the sample, but the center of the rotation of the sample and the center of the detector are on a straight line. This is a required condition for the reconstructed image to be in focus. But in reality, you might change the sample stage position, maybe even you move the detector to change the magnification factor or field of view, and things can get off a little bit. When this happens, the center of the detector is just a pixel or location that we're picking as a center. You can shift it so that the X-ray focus the sample rotation center and the detector center are still on a straight line. And this shift is the focus correction or center correction. And there are many little things you can correct during the reconstruction process, but this correction of the center position on the detector is one of the most important one. Now, we understand what this is, but how do we do this correction? How do you know how much to shift the center? So let's take a look at this. So I'm gonna show in an example of how to do a focus correction. So this is a cross section of a wire and this image is out of focus. And you change this correction parameter little by little and try to find a place where it comes in focus. And if you pass this point, it's gonna go out of focus again. So by changing this parameter little by little, you can tell, okay, so this is in focus. So you have a good correction parameter and you apply that parameter for the entire volume reconstruction. So this is how you can correct it. And this is easy to do when you have an image like this one, it's really simple. And it can be a little bit more tricky if you have a complicated structure. So I wanna show you another example. This is a cross section of a bamboo tree, and this is out of focus. The process is the same. You change the parameter until you see the image come to focus, and if you pass this point, it goes out of focus again. So by going through the same process, even when the structure looks a little bit complicated, you can usually tell when it comes in focus. So this is how you can do the focus or center correction. 
And it's important to do this part accurately when you're trying to achieve high resolution. So that's one. Now, the next point is to eliminate the sample movement or deformation. So again, we want to take a picture of this girl, but let's say it takes five minutes. That means she needs to stay still for five minutes. And if she can't, the picture would look like this. And the same thing can happen to X-ray CT imaging. This is a 3D rendered image of freestanding fibers, X-ray CT image. And if you look at a cross section, it would look like this. And if all those fibers stayed still, the cross section shows nice and round cross sections of the fibers. But it could look like this. So in this image, most of the fibers look round, but something is not right about this one. This fiber was moving during the experiment. So this is a cross section of a fiber that stayed still. This one was moving during the scan. And this might look like it's just out of focus. And definitely you can try to bring this into focus by changing the correction parameter. But there are times that no matter what you do with the correction, it doesn't seem like you can bring the whole image into focus. The part of it goes out of focus or you can't find a good parameter. And that is usually a sign that the sample was moving or changing its shape. And that is not good. So how do we prevent this? There are a couple of things you can do to prevent this problem. Rule number one, secure the sample. You probably use some sort of sample holder or maybe a pin, and you can put glue or tape and put the sample on top of it. For the glue, you can use things like UV resin or epoxy. If you're using resin, make sure that you wait long enough to cure the resin completely. I like to use a UV resin because I don't need to wait for a long time. But if you use epoxy, you might want to wait 24 hours or so to make sure that it's completely cured. You can use utility wax. Uh, this is a type of wax dentists use. You can use carbon tape or even just regular double-sided tape as well. If your sample is porous, like foam samples, you might not want to use a resin that can get into the pores or cells. Then you can use regular double-sided tape. And when you use tape, what you do not want to do is to press, especially elastic sample against that tape firmly. You do not want to do this. I can see why you might be tempted to do it. You're securing the sample. But if you do this with an elastic sample, it could take a long time for the sample to spring back. So instead, it's better to just gently place a sample on a piece of tape. If it's a light and small sample, it's not going to move. You don't need to really press it. Another thing I've seen cause trouble is a long and thin sample. You don't want to stick a long and thin sample into wax or glue like this because most likely the top part is gonna wobble. So ideally, you wanna cut it short so that it doesn't move. And if you can cut it, you can try to image the bottom part of the sample because the bottom part is not gonna move that much, at least compared to the top part of the sample. So this is rule number one, secure the sample. Rule number two, wait long enough. You might be surprised when you do really high resolution scan, like sub micron scan, how much sample can move or change its shape after you mount it. So you might wanna wait for a while after you mount the sample to make sure that the sample is not gonna move or change its shape during the scan. And the way to do this is to look at the 2D projection of the sample and then monitor it for a while. So this image, was taken from a foam sample right after it was mounted. And if you keep looking at this 2D image, you can see this foam spring back. Even after 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, it's still slowly moving. And after about, so this is 
56 minutes. After about an hour, it stops moving. So you can collect the 2D image, about the one image per minute for 30 minutes or an hour, then you can see if the sample is still moving or it stopped moving. It might become a little bit difficult to tell if the sample is still moving towards the end of this process because the movement slows down. And another thing you can do to do this more accurately is to calculate the difference between the current image and the last image. By last image, I mean the one that was corrected right at the end of the process, maybe an hour later after you mounted the sample. So this is the difference between the first image collected right after the sample was mounted on that phone and the last image that was collected one hour later. So the white pixels you're seeing here are the difference between the first and the last image. And if you go through, those images for 56 minutes, you can see that those difference in you know, white pixels slowly disappear. And about 45 minutes later, you don't see any white pixels. And after an hour, you can be sure that the sample is not moving anymore. So this is something you can do to make sure that the sample is not moving before you start a scan. And it's a little bit of a process but if you were to spend 10, 20 hours, it might not be a bad idea to spend a half an hour or an hour to make sure that the sample is not moving because if the sample keeps moving for the first hour of the 10 hour scan, that hour could ruin your 10 hour scan. So it's always good to make sure that the sample is not moving when you do high resolution imaging. So that's rule number two, wait long enough. But what if the sample is unstable? The waiting long enough is not gonna help. It could be anything, the sample keeps sagging slowly or it could melt or it could get dehydrated and shrink. For whatever reason, if the sample is unstable, you can try to run a fast scan. So remember this girl who couldn't stay still for five minutes. The picture could look like this if you use five minute exposure. But if you shorten the exposure time to let's say split second, and the picture could look like this and she doesn't need to stay still. You can use the same trick for X-ray CT. I will show you an example. So we had this unwoven fabric that just slowly keeps sagging and it wouldn't stay still. And we tried 129 minute scan first. Then you can see that those fibers are moving. They are all blurred and have some streaks coming out of them. You can't even see the shape of the fibers. And this is because the fibers were moving during the scan. So instead, we scanned the same sample in 12 minutes. And this image looks a lot better. So let's zoom in a little bit. So this is the 129 minute scan. You can see that the fibers look blurry and you have some streaks coming out of them. Again, those fibers are moving. But the 12 minute scan looks a lot better. You can see the individual shapes of the fiber cross sections and you don't see any streaks coming out of them. And the sample was still moving during this, this 12 minute scan but the movement is a lot smaller compared to 129 minute scan. So running a fast scan is something you can do if the sample is just unstable. And when you do a fast scan, you're gonna compromise on the X-ray intensity. So if possible, try to increase the X-ray intensity or try to use high powered X-ray generator to do a fast scan. Okay, so to summarize, the basic rules for high resolution imaging is to use a high magnification factor or switch to the parallel beam geometry. And we just talked about those uh, additional high resolution imaging keys. Now using those techniques, let's take a look at more examples. So what can we do with the CT for phones? You can analyze things like the porosity 
And if they have a fillers, you can look at the filler distribution. You can always look at the cell size, shape, or their distributions. And you can look at the cell wall thickness. And always you can visualize the overall morphology. And there are a lot of foam materials around us. You find some maybe in your office or home, like earplugs. So I'm going to show you a comparison of two different kinds of earplugs. Both of them are just cheap store brand, and they actually look the same from the outside. And this is what brand A looks like, and this is what brand B looks like. And they do look different. And if you use them, actually, brand A works better. I don't know why, but A works better. And when you look at those images, you can tell that the pores are larger with the brand A. And you can do segmentation and object separation and calculate the cell volume for both of them and do the quantitative comparison. And if you calculate the mean cell volume for brand A, it comes out as 3.1 times 10 to the sixth cubic micron. If you do the same thing for brand B, it's about a third of it. So sometimes you can just look at the images and tell what's different between the two, but you can always quantify the difference by doing this type of analysis. So those are, those are earplugs. Another type of foam material you might find at home is the makeup sponge. There are so many different kinds of makeup sponges. I started to wonder, are they any different or are they all the same? I don't know how many of you use makeup sponges, and if you don't and are wondering if there are many different kinds, there are so many different kinds that the Glamour magazine did an article a couple of years ago titled Your Ultimate Guide to Makeup Sponges. So there are many different kinds. So I thought maybe it's interesting to compare the premium brand expensive sponge and a store brand inexpensive one. I picked a premium brand, $20 piece sponge. It's just the size of an egg and it's $20 a piece. And I picked another one. This one is a store brand, about the same size, $5 a piece. They kind of look the same from the outside, just like the earplugs. But if you look at them with X-ray CT, the premium brand looks like this. It looks a little bit like the earplugs. And the store brand looks like this they actually look pretty different. You can do segmentation and see that the premium brand has just a polymer and relatively large cells. And the store brand has the polymer and smaller cells, but it also has a lot of high density fillers. If you quantify those phases, you realize that the polymer percentage is not that different between the two, 9% but the store brand has a lot of high density fillers over 3%. And I said that they look the same, but if you squeeze them, actually the premium brand is a lot softer and the store brand is more firm. While I was doing this comparison, I realized that the manufacturer of this premium brand $20 sponge would tell you that you have to buy a new one every three months. And I thought it's kind of expensive and also wondered, it's just a piece of polymer, what could have happened to it in three months? So I did an experiment and got a brand new one and it used the same sponge, I washed it every day, but it used the same one for seven months and looked at what happened to the sponge seven months later. And this is the old one. The seven month old sponge does not look at anything like the brand new one. You can see that this polymer is all torn apart. You can't even see the shapes of those pores anymore. So this is probably why you're supposed to buy a new one every three months. Again, by looking at those images, you can clearly tell that they are different, but you can do the segmentation and do quantitative comparison, like porosity. And it turns out that the porosity uh, changed as well. So it was over 90% when it was brand new but now it's 
And when you, again, squeeze them, you can kind of feel the difference. The older one is a lot more firm than the brand new one. So this is an example of makeup sponges. Another type of foam you might see around you is the heating slider. And for the heating slider, as I mentioned a little bit before, it's important to increase the porosity, to have a lot of air in it. And to do so, you have to make the polymer cell walls very, very thin. So it might be interesting to analyze the cell wall thickness. So let's take a look at an example. So this is a cross section of a heat insulator. And you can see that this looks different from the earplugs or makeup sponges. The cell walls are very, very thin to increase the porosity. And you can do segmentation and calculate the porosity. Then you can also do the wall thickness distribution analysis. So this image is just 2D, but let's take a look at this in 3D. So this is a color-coded wall thickness distribution analysis results. Purple to blue indicates very thin wall, a couple of microns to five microns. And green to yellow indicates thick part of the wall, up to 23 microns. And when you look at this in 3D, it's very clear that the cell walls are very, very thin almost everywhere, only a couple of microns, it's all purple. But there are those green lines with the little yellowish corners where the multiple cells meet. So when you have two cells meet, meeting, uh, you have green that is about 15 to 20 microns. And at the corners where more than two cells are meeting, you have 20, 23 micron walls. Overall, the mean thickness was 4.6 microns and the maximum was 23.3 microns. So this is an example of a heat insulator. Another type of foam we might see around us is the type of foams that work as shock absorbers, like the foam you might see in the sole of a shoe. And for foams that work as shock absorbers, you might be interested in what happens when they're compressed. So you can compress those foams and continue X-ray CT scans to see what happens to them when they are compressed. And I'll show you an example. So this is a piece of foam we took out of a sole of a shoe. And this is the CT cross section. And this is a 3D rendering. Those red bits you see are the fillers. So you can compress this foam with some pressure, let's say seven megapascal, and do a CT scan. And do a little bit more at 14 megapascal, do another scan. Then of course you can go back to zero megapascal and do another scan to see if this foam springs back to the original shape. And this one didn't. And now at this point you have multiple CT scans collected from different stages of compressing the foam. And you can apply different kinds of quantitative analysis and do, for example, cell size analysis. Then you can, for example, look at the large cells and see how those large cells are being compressed and if they are springing back well. And how does that different from the smaller cells reaction? And those are the details you can analyze when you do this type of in-stew compression analysis. Okay, so those are the example analysis that you can apply to foam materials. So let's move on to composites. What can we do with a CTE for them? Composites are, by definition, a mixture of different phases. So of course, you can do volume fraction analysis for different phases. And many of them have fibers or fillers, so you can see their distribution. If you have fibers, you might be interested in the orientation. If you have voids or uh, holes, you can see them. And when those composites get damaged or cracked, you can see those cracks as well. So let's take a look at carbon fibers. This is a cross-section of a carbon fiber reinforced polymer. 
And this might look familiar to you because this is the example we used in the second webinar when we were discussing how to analyze this image and do data analysis. Using those techniques we learned in the second webinar, you can segment this into three different phases. The polymer, blue, and the carbon fibers, yellow, and the voice or air, red. And once you segment the image into different phases, you can apply different kinds of quantitative analysis. For example, you can look at the fiber orientation. The green fibers are the vertically oriented ones, and the blue and the red fibers are tilted ones. And you can see the majority of them are vertically oriented. Those are short fibers, so you might want to look at the aspect ratio too. And purple to blue fibers are long fibers, and green and yellow ones are short. And when you do two different types of analysis on one data set, like in this case, we did the orientation and the aspect ratio, you might realize that there is a correlation. So this fiber is very long, and the same fiber is also vertically oriented. So you can make a scatter plot of the aspect ratio and fiber orientation, and you can see that there is a correlation and the longer fibers are more vertically oriented. For this example, we used about half a micron resolution because we wanted to see the individual fibers that are 7.5 microns in diameter. But you can change the resolution and look at a bigger picture, like this one. So this is about two millimeter square of a carbon fiber reinforced polymer with a lot of voids inside. And when you look at this image in 2D with optical microscope or SEM, you might not think much about those voids. Some of them are long and some of them are short. But X-ray CT is a 3D imaging technique, so you can see those voids in 3D. And when you look at this in 3D, it becomes clear that the voids are creating some sort of lattice in this composite. So this is an example of a little bit larger field of view. Okay, so this is another carbon fiber example. Another type of composite is just a simple mixture of fillers and matrix. And one way to make it is to mix the fillers and the matrix and pour the mixture into a container and let it cure. We had this type of sample and did filler percentage analysis at the top of the container. And it turned out to be 12% by volume. And we did exactly the same analysis at the bottom of this container, and it turned out to be 35%. This is more than double of what it was at the top. This could happen when the fillers are denser than the matrix, and it takes a long time to cure the whole material because the fillers can be sinking slowly and generating non-uniform distribution. Another type of composites you actually might have in your office is the wood composites. And this is a cross section of a piece of a bookshelf. And when you look at this cross section, you realize that the surface area is more dense compared to the center area that's less dense. And you can visualize the density distribution in 3D like this. And again, a red surface is high density and the blue middle section is lower density. You can take a cross section here and calculate the percentage of a solid or the packing density and it's 98.7%. You can do the same thing in the middle of this composite and it's 80.9%. And by doing this for different cross sections, you can quantitatively analyze the gradual change of the packing density. So those are all intact composites. They are not broken or damaged. But if they get damaged or crack, you can see the damages and cracks. This is an example of a lens embedded in fiber composites. This is part of a smartphone. And if you look at this cross section closely, you realize that there is a little bit of a black speckle here. 
And this is a crack between the fiber composite and the lens. And this is just a 2D cross section, but you can of course investigate this crack and how far it goes in 3D. And when the damage or crack is this big, this one is probably a couple hundred microns, it's easy to see. But what about those small cracks or fine cracks or maybe cracks that are almost closed? They can be a little bit challenging to image, but you can use a contrasting agent to highlight those cracks. And this is a commonly a widely used contrasting agent recipe. So what you do is to take 250 grams of zinc iodide. Zinc iodide is very X-ray absorbing. So this is your contrasting agent. And you mix that into 80 milliliters of distilled water and 80 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol. And you add a little bit of Kodak Photoflow. And you soak the sample in this mixture for one or two days. I will show you an example. So this is a cross section of carbon fiber reinforced polymer. And it looks all dark. There are supposed to be cracks, but you can't really see them. After soaking the sample in the contrast agent for two days, the same cross section now looks like this. So you can see the cracks all highlighted, the vertical ones and the horizontal ones. This is because the zinc iodide went into those cracks and now it's absorbing a lot of x-rays and those cracks are highlighted in the reconstructed image. Now people do this to see where the cracks are because they want to know where they are. You might want to know where they start. You might want to see how they propagate and you might want to see if the cracks are always in the matrix or do they go through the fillers or fibers. So you, it's important to know where those cracks are. And to know where they are, not only that you have to see the cracks, you also have to see the difference between the fibers and matrix, for example. And the last example I'm going to show you is one of those cases. And this one was a little bit challenging because the fibers were silicon carbide and the matrix was also silicon carbide. Because both fibers, the matrix had the same chemical makeup, there was not a whole lot of density difference. That means there is not a whole lot of X-ray contrast. So we used molybdenum 17 keV characteristic radiation to maximize the contrast difference between the fibers and the matrix. And this is the image we were able to get. It is a subtle, but you can see that there are those lighter gray circles. And those are the silicon carbide fibers that have a slightly higher density than the silicon carbide matrix. The cracks are easy to see because they're relatively large. So now you can tell the difference between among those three phases. So you can segment them and highlight the cracks and see them in 3D. And when you look at it like this, you can tell that the cracks are always in the matrix part. If you look at this from a different angle, again, the cracks are always in the matrix. It's always, uh, no, the cracks are not only just in the matrix, when they get closer to the fibers, they go in between the fibers and stay in the matrix. So this image tells you that the fibers are not cracking or breaking. They're still trying to keep the piece together. And the cracks are always propagating inside of the matrix. Okay, so those are some example analysis you can do for composites. And we looked at some examples in foam um, samples as well. So using those techniques you learned today, when you look at a sample like this the next time, I hope that your image is not going to look like this or this but this one, so that you can do good quantitative analysis. Okay, you just learned some keys to high resolution imaging and looked at some foams and composites applications. All images you saw today were collected on the Rigaku X-ray CT scanners. 
And if you'd like to learn more about them, please contact your local sales representative or go to rigaku.com and contact. So this is the last session of the webinar series. And I mentioned a couple of topics we discussed in the previous webinars. If you missed them, you can find the recordings at www.rigaku.com slash en slash webinars slash x-ray CT introduction, or you can just search Rigaku webinar and go to list of CT webinars. Before we go into the Q&A session, I would like to make just one uh, announcement. So we're going to have the next x-ray microscopy seminar and a workshop at University of Delaware in New York. And it's going to be on April 1st, Wednesday next year. If you're interested, please save the date and we will send you an invitation when the registration opens in mid-February. Thank you. Okay, Aya, uh, thanks very much. Very, very interesting talk and thanks a lot for presenting. Um, and it appears we'll have some time for about a 10 minute uh, Q&A. We have a number of questions that have come in during the presentation. I have that first question from Ronald in California. Um, is it possible to run a sample that is larger than the FOV, for example, a full shoe or a section of an automotive part, and then combine the images into a full rendering of the complete sample? And yes, you can. But you can do multiple scans on large or long sample and stitch them together to generate a one uh, reconstructed image. One thing you might want to be careful about is you can end up um, having a really large file when you do it. So you want to watch the voxel size and the resolution so that the resulting file doesn't get too big. But uh, you can do that stitching and a lot of X-ray CT scanners can do it automatically. Okay. Um, I have another question from uh, T. Yang in Boston. Uh, due to the low energy possibilities of the system, is it possible to image extremely low density materials such as uh, styrofoam? And yes, of course, there is a limit of how light of a things you can see with x-rays, especially with the uh, laboratory based x-ray sources. But styrofoam, and yes, for example, the Rigaku Nano 3DX has chromium target that can give you 5.4 keV uh, characteristic radiation. And that's low enough to see styrofoam with no problem. You can probably use copper at 8 keV as well. Okay. Um, any further questions? That's all we have in the queue right now. Anyone? Okay. Um, just so you know, that's all we're gonna do for today with the questions, but if you do wanna send some in after the fact, we'll uh, do our best to get back to everyone shortly. And as I said earlier, a recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow. An email will go out to all registrants with instructions how to view the recorded presentation in case you want to uh, watch that with somebody else or turn someone else onto it. Uh, after the close of the webinar today, you'll be automatically directed to our landing page for the webinar series in case you missed any of the previous three. Uh, note that uh, Zoom may interrupt the transfer to the landing page with a request for you to participate in the survey. Uh, you can click continue just to get to the landing page. One last thing today uh, before we close, which today's our last of the uh, series of four, we're gonna show a little credit reel that uh, show all of the people that participated in the production of the four part webinar series. So take a look and maybe you'll see somebody you know and uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thank you.